he was wise not to take that extension because he's going to get more money if he keeps this up, a lot more money. And we've all thrown around the number 500 million. At this rate, who knows what the number might be. Welcome everyone to the April Fool's edition of Fair Territory. Now we're not going to engage in any pranks today. I'm not going to tell you that I'm six foot six or that the Colorado Rockies are going to win the World Series. Neither of those things is anything remotely related to reality. And we're also not going to engage in the typical April game of massive overreaction. We've only seen three or four games in most cases from each team, but hey, these are games that count. We can certainly react to what we've seen without getting too carried away. And I want to start off with the guy who right now is the sun, moon, and the stars of Major League Baseball. He is the centerpiece of the New York Yankees. He is the talk of the game again after leading the Yankees to a four-game sweep of the Houston Astros this weekend. You know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about Juan Soto. He is back, and he is back in a big way. In case you missed it, let me recap his weekend for you. Starts off Thursday with a game-saving throw, gunning down a runner at the plate, Mauricio Dubon. Friday, he's on base four times. Saturday, he hits the go-ahead home run in the seventh inning. And then Sunday, what did he do? Ninth inning, left-on-left -left matchup against the game's best closer, Josh Hader. Go-ahead single to the opposite field. That was Juan Soto's first weekend as a New York Yankee. Let's look at the statistics just to get a feel for exactly how dominant he was. I know it's only four games. I know it's a small sample size, but my goodness. Nine for 17, a homer, three walks, four RBIs, a double in there as well. 529 batting average, 600 on base, 765 slug, and a tidy 1.365 OPS. Now, Juan Soto last year in San Diego had a good offensive year, ranked eighth in the majors in OPS at 930. That's typical Juan Soto for the most part. He's had better years, but he was a great offensive player as he always is. What he wasn't was a very good outfielder in left, nor a very good base runner. And now with the Yankees, we're seeing, it seems, a revived player in almost every phase of the game. I wrote today in The Athletic about just how he has improved his defense. He, of course, has moved to right field with the Yankees, but he worked hard on his defense this offseason with Jackie Bradley Jr., also a free agent and a guy represented by Scott Boris. They were training together in Miami. And since joining the Yankees, he has worked closely with their outfield instructor, Luis Rojas. You remember him. He's the former Mets manager. Obviously, it's a contract year. We know players in contract years sometimes show a little bit more motivation. But as I wrote, Soto was a good outfielder in the past in Washington. I don't know exactly what happened in San Diego, but this is more in line with what we saw in Washington, if not maybe a little bit better. He's played really well in the outfield so far, and suddenly it looks like the Yankees with Verdugo in left, Judge in center, and Soto in right might have an above-average defensive outfield. Now, you remember as well last year in San Diego when he wasn't going so great and things were kind of happening, the team was falling apart, and even though he was producing offensively, there was some thought, at least in some circles of the game, that because of his defensive decline, his base running, that maybe he wouldn't be a guy who gets the big money. Maybe he should have taken the Nationals' 15-year, $440 million offer of an extension. Well, forget that notion. He was wise not to take that extension because he's going to get more money if he keeps this up, a lot more money. And we've all thrown around the number 500 million. At this rate, when he's going into his age 26 season in 2025, that will be his first free agent year. Who knows what the number might be? Juan Soto is playing at a higher level than even he has played at before. And it's interesting to me, the trade to San Diego from Washington happened in midseason, 2022. It seemed to leave him discombobulated. This trade to the Yankees happened in the offseason. He had a full offseason to prepare. He had been through this once before. He had a full spring with his new team. And certainly, he seems like he's in a really good place. Now, the other thing with Soto is his effect on the Yankees, effect on the team as a whole. 
We've talked about protection and there are statistical analysts who will tell you that protection is an overrated concept, that Juan Soto hitting second in front of Aaron Judge is not going to make a big difference for Juan Soto. Well, he certainly thinks it will. And I spoke with him about that in an interview I did for Fox on Saturday. And he mentioned that Judge hitting behind him is huge. And I also believe that even though Judge isn't off to the greatest start, that Soto hitting in front of him is going to be huge for him because Soto is on base so often. And there's one other aspect of this as well. We talked about this on the broadcast Saturday in addition to all of these other things. Oswaldo Cabrera, off to a hot start for the Yankees. He told Chris Kirshner of The Athletic that basically he's been following Soto around and he noticed watching him in the batting cage that what Soto does is try to hit line drive after line drive after line drive. So Cabrera thought to himself, what am I doing trying to hit home runs all the time? And he basically has kind of followed Soto around, trying to not mimic what he does because no one can mimic what Juan Soto does, but at least take lessons from him. It's obviously had a good effect on Oswaldo Cabrera. He too is off to a great start. So here are the Yankees, 4-0 in Houston. They're doing this without Gary Cole. Obviously, it's four games. Obviously, they have to get healthy with regard to Cole. They have to stay healthy. DJ LeMahieu is also hurt right now with a foot injury. We don't know how this is all going to turn out. We've seen various teams, Yankee teams, other teams get hot before and slow down. We've seen teams start slowly and get hot. Four games, folks. But if you're a Yankee fan, seeing the Yankees balance in their lineup, the more left-handed presence, the better defense that they're showing, the bullpen, which has been really good, you've got to be encouraged. Now, on the other side of town in New York, we've got a little bit different perspective. And let's start with, well, let's start with what we would have used in Grilling Ken, that segment, but it's such a good tweet that we've got to start with it right here. Let's go to a fan's reaction to the Mets. His handle is same old Jets Mets. He's a beleaguered man. He says, how do I stop being a Mets fan because it's ruining my life? Now, Yankee fans can be self-hating, but I don't know that any group of fans is more self-hating than Mets fans. And there is reason for that. They haven't won a World Series since 1986. They've had various problems since then. And here they are with a team that, well, it cost a lot of money, but a team that started the season 0-3 against the Milwaukee Brewers, a team that does not have Corbin Burns, does not have Brandon Woodruff, does not have Devin Williams, and yet the Mets looked outclassed by them all weekend. And of course, the weekend started with a play, a controversial play of sorts, at least in the mind of Jeff McNeil, in which Reese Hoskins slid late but legally into second base. And you can see the play right here. We've seen it 100 times already. There's Hoskins going into McNeil. This is a play where he stays on the bag, so it's legal. He didn't go in high. He did go in late. Okay, McNeil gets a little upset, but, well, McNeil got a lot upset. And it was kind of an overreaction, to say the least. And it sort of set the tone for this whole weekend, because what happened? The Mets didn't react by throwing at Hoskins the next day. They waited until the end of the game after Hoskins had another RBI hit and a three-run homer. And the Mets drew some criticism from their own announcers. Ron Darling and Keith Hernandez, former players, said, "Uh, you waited too long to do that. Now, Ron and Keith are not advocating throwing at Reese Hoskins per se. What they're arguing is that the Mets should have made him uncomfortable at the plate, moved him off the plate at the very least, and perhaps thrown at his hip or below, which is the way players in the past have addressed situations like this. The Mets didn't do that. Then, of course, they throw behind them later in the game, eight feet behind them or whatever it was. It looked ridiculous. It resulted in a three-game suspension for Ramirez, and the Mets just were out of sorts all weekend. They also didn't hit. Eight runs in three games, 202 batting average, 598 OPS, and that's after hitting four home runs in the series, that OPS. So not a good weekend for the Mets. They're without J.D. Martinez. They're without Kodai Senga, of course, but I'm not so sure this is going to be the team that they envision. I've not been sure about that from the very beginning. Got significant starting pitching questions. I want to see this lineup score before I really believe it's a dynamic lineup. They will score at times, and J.D. will help. But Milwaukee is an interesting team, and they shouldn't be as good. Council is gone. All the players I mentioned are gone. 
but they have what a lot of teams are looking for, it seems to me. And it's sort of this winning culture or vibe about them. They're very athletic as well. And Jackson Churio, the rookie, was a revelation this weekend. So was Bryce Terang defensively, and so was the new infielder they acquired from the Orioles, Joey Ortiz. All around, it's an athletic team. It's a team that knows how to win games. And even under their new manager, Pat Murphy, so far, so good. We'll see if their pitching holds up. Also in the good vibe department, the building culture department, the improvement department, I present to you the Pittsburgh Pirates. Now I'm going to qualify what the Pirates did because they played the Marlins this weekend, swept them four games. The Marlins are a team essentially without their starting rotation right now. Alcantara is down, Yuri Perez is down, Braxton Garrett is down. They are basically without everyone, Edward Cabrera as well. That's four starting pitchers. They're not a team that spent money in the offseason. They signed, I believe, one major league free agent, and that was Tim Anderson for $5 million. So they're not a good team. But the Pirates are looking to be more interesting. You saw their whiff master, Jared Jones, in action. Paul Skeens is a AAA already dominating. Henry Davis, the former number one overall pick, looks much better at catcher and offensively. I don't know that this is going to be a good team, but they've got this schedule, and we'll take a look here, to maybe do some things at least early and maybe build confidence. And of course, they went through this last year. We'll talk about that. But here's their schedule, upcoming. At Washington, a team that they should be able to handle. At home against Baltimore. Now, Baltimore looks really good. Home against Detroit, they're much improved as well, or at least somewhat improved. Then at Philly, tough series. At the Mets, a team that they should be at least in competition with. And in Boston, which played well in its first series against Seattle, starting pitching was outstanding. Now, look at the bottom of the screen. Last year, the Pirates, of course, went 20 and 9 in March and April, 56 and 77 the rest of the way. So, buyer beware here. But at the same time, this is a team that should be growing. And it's a team that is starting to bring its prospects to the majors and starting to get some more production out of its young players. You might remember at the start of the spring, I co wrote a story with Steven Nesbitt about the Pirates and basically asking the question when are these guys going to wake up? And much of the article was focused on their owner, Bob Nutting, because he has not spent money and he has not addressed the team the way he should in many ways. But we also focused on their player development and how, to this point, it had not really been that productive considering how high they've been drafting. Well, maybe now we're going to start to see some things change a little bit for the Pittsburgh Pirates. I'm not sure. I'm not convinced. I want to see a lot more before I believe it. But the Pirates, along with the Tigers and some of these other downtrodden teams, are going to be really interesting to watch in the early going. Time now for the Inside Dish. This is the part of the show where I go inside a story I've written recently or inside a trend in the game or just go off entirely on some other topic. But this week, I do want to talk about a story that I co-wrote with the Athletics' Fabian Ardaya, and it came out on opening day. It was a story about the Dodgers' billion-dollar offseason. Now, these stories are kind of typical in our business, a recap of a dramatic offseason, and this one arguably was the most dramatic in baseball history. It certainly was the most expensive. And we had the idea in late January or so that we really wanted to do this. We really wanted to dive into it, get into it. So we contacted the Dodgers, Fabian and I, and we asked about interviewing their top executives. We said we'd like to sit down with them, kind of go through everything, and the Dodgers responded by saying, guys, that's fine, but ESPN is working on a very similar story, and perhaps you'd like to revisit this after their story comes out or do something else entirely. Their concern, and it was a rightful concern, was that the two stories would be too much alike. And while they don't dictate editorial coverage, we certainly did not want to do exactly the same story ESPN was doing. So we decided, okay, let's take a step back. Let's wait for their story, which was coming out at the start of spring training. It was written by Alden Gonzalez. And let's take a look then and see if there is still ground for us to cover. And the story Alden wrote was a very good story from the Dodgers' perspective. It talked with all their executives and got their perspectives on what they were doing, went back in time a little bit, and just was a really good recap of what the Dodgers did. What we envisioned was something different. 
what we envisioned was a more global look at this offseason involving the other teams as well. Toronto Blue Jays in their pursuit of Otani, the Tampa Bay Rays with the trade talks that went on with Tyler Glass now, and all of the teams, the Mets, the Yankees, the Phillies, that were in on Yoshinobu Yamamoto. We wanted to look at the whole thing, and we felt we had the ability to do it. Fabian is our Dodgers beat writer. Does a great job, great connections with them, great rapport with the players. He interviewed several of them. I interviewed some others. And then when I went to Florida, I hit the Mets, David Stearns. I hit the Yankees, Brian Cashman, Aaron Boone, the Phillies, Dave Dombrowski, Bryce Harper, the Rays, Eric Neander. So we have all these pieces coming together. And we're aiming for opening day for our story, just to give it some separation from the ESPN story, and because that, of course, would be an appropriate time to run it. Now, there are some different elements in this story as well. And the different elements involve people from the entertainment world, the country music star Brad Paisley, and the television actor Brian Baumgartner, who, of course, played Kevin Malone in The Office. Now, I'm not going to give away the whole story, but Paisley hosted a party at his barn on the grounds of his residence in Nashville during the winter meetings. And that was a party that occurred the night that Dave Roberts blurted out that the Dodgers had spoken with Shohei Otani, met with Shohei Otani earlier in the day. So there was a little bit of tension there. And it was also the night that as the party went on, the Dodgers people invited their old friends from the Rays to come over and that's how kind of Tyler Glass Now Trade Talks got started. So you might ask, okay, how do you get in touch with Brad Paisley? Well, here's the really interesting part. I wrote about the story a little bit in the windup, just how it came together and some thoughts on it, but we didn't talk about this. Brad Paisley is a huge Dodgers fan. And his connection to the team is through the host of Dodgers Talk. I believe he has been a guest on foul territory, David Vasse. David, of course, does a great job with his radio show, and Paisley was a faithful listener, got in touch with David at one point, and they kind of became friends. That's how that party came together, with Paisley telling David he wanted to have some Dodgers people over during the winter meetings just so they can get away from it, take a little bit of a break. And sure enough, David hosted his show from there that night. So to get in touch with Brad Paisley, the first thing we had to do was get in touch with David Vasse. And David was gracious enough to pass along Paisley's manager's number. Paisley was very excited to talk about the whole thing. He loved talking about baseball. He's a huge fan. And man, what a thrill it was to talk to him. Brian Baumgartner, he played golf with Dave Roberts the day of the fake flight to Toronto that Otani was supposedly on. And Dave basically fell apart on the golf course playing with Baumgartner in a foursome as he was getting reports of Otani seemingly slipping away. He too was a lot of fun to talk to. Dave Roberts was gracious enough to pass along his number. So this is how the story came together. And it was so much fun talking to everyone involved, not just the entertainment people, but the people in baseball, because there were some really cool things that occurred along the way, really interesting anecdotes that we gathered. So about a week before the season started, we've got the story pretty much written. And what happened? The gambling story broke. The Ipe, Otane, whatever this thing is, whatever it will turn out to be. And suddenly at that point, I went into a mild panic. And I went into a panic because I was thinking all of this work that we did and this story that we were so excited to bring to our readers was going to go to waste. So at that point, we talked about it. We thought, okay, is the Otani situation going to overshadow everything else, kind of render this story irrelevant in a certain sense? And as it developed, as Otani held his news conference and all of that, we thought, okay, the story is still relevant. They still had the billion dollar offseason, 1.4 billion to be exact. And we still thought people would be interested in it. But in journalism sometimes, and this goes beyond sports, of course, things will happen that will change the perspective of a story, change the details of a story, make a story, well, obsolete. That didn't quite happen here. I'm not sure the story had the same impact it would have if the Otani situation had never occurred. But again, it was a lot of fun to write, a lot of fun to report, and that's not usually the case. Usually these things are difficult, 
I don't know any writer that says he or she enjoys writing that much when you sit down at the keyboard and just like have a smile on your face. With this story, we did have smiles on our faces as we put it together. And that is something that I don't know that I've experienced very much in, I don't know, nearly four decades of doing this. So if you haven't read the story, we hope you do. We hope you enjoy it. And again, one of my all time favorites. Time now for Grilling Ken. We've got some good ones this week. Let's get to your questions. The first one comes from Gary Goldberg, who asks, how come Johan Ramirez gets suspended, but nothing happens to Reese Hoskins? I assume Gary Goldberg is a Mets fan. We talked about Mets fans in the first segment. Gary, the question you're asking here, I don't want to be hard on you, but why should Reese Hoskins get suspended? What exactly did he do? His slide was legal. Now, yes, he did this, but I don't think you get suspended for making the crybaby sign to the other team. So there was nothing that Reese Hoskins did here that would warrant a suspension. And Ramirez got suspended, obviously, for throwing behind Reese Hoskins. Can't do that. Got the automatic one-game suspension for his manager, Carlos Mendoza, as well. He sits out game three of his first managerial job. That's great. So, no, there was no reason for Reese Hoskins to get suspended, and Mets fans can just keep booing him next time. That's the only penalty he will possibly receive. And by the way, he seemed to quite enjoy it. Now let's get to the next question. What do we got? From Isaac, Philly Isaac, who asked, biggest overreaction after the first weekend? Great question, Isaac. I appreciate this one. And we've got to give it to the Los Angeles Angels. They didn't even wait until after the first weekend to overreact. They had a team meeting after getting their butts handed to them by the Orioles two games into the season. Ron Washington, their new manager, called a meeting. And actually, kidding aside, it was probably a smart thing to do because he basically was telling his players, guys, we're better than this. Calm down. Let's just get our acts together. Angels won the third game of that series. Are they good? No, they're not good. I don't believe they're going to have a good year. And we're going to have trout questions come up again. Will Mike Trout want out? Will he get traded? All the old questions, the familiar questions that hang over the Angels are going to still hang over the Angels. But yeah, that would be my biggest reaction. I can't recall a team meeting after two games. I can recall a manager getting fired after six games because I covered that manager, Cal Ripken Sr., the late Cal Ripken Sr. That was in 1988. Orioles started off 0-6 and, and the move was so good. Firing the manager is such a brilliant idea that they went on to lose 15 more, start of the year, 0 and 21. All right, now on to the next question. We go to Kyle Davis. Kyle asks, fair or foul, the Rangers have gotten no respect from experts with preseason predictions. Kyle, I assume you're a Rangers fan, and I'm going to tell you the same thing I tell fans every time they ask about respect from the national media or any other media for that matter. Who cares? Respect from the media is about the least consequential thing I could think of as a fan. And if I'm a fan and I perceive my team is getting no respect from the media, well, it will give me that much more satisfaction when my team defies the so-called experts and proves them wrong. So I wouldn't worry about preseason predictions. In fact, I didn't even make any this year for the most part because I'm sick of being wrong all the time. Preseason predictions... I always say this, tell me who's going to get hurt, tell me who's going to get traded, tell me who's going to underperform and overperform, and I'll give you the best preseason predictions you've ever heard. Well, we don't know those things in advance. Next question, final question, I believe, is what's your biggest surprise both on and off the field after the first series of the season? Well, I'll do it on the field. I don't know that we've had anything off the field that surprising. Maybe the injuries, although could anyone call injuries a surprise at this stage of the game's evolution? But the biggest surprise on the field to me is the Houston Astros' continued difficulties at Minute Maid Park. And this didn't just start with them getting swept four games at home by the Yankees to start this season. This goes back, goes back to last year in the playoffs. They are 1 and 12 in their last 13 games at home including the playoffs, 7 and 26 in their last 33 including the postseason. Now, before the broadcast on Saturday, we met with the manager of the Astros, the new manager, Joe Espada, 
And John Smoltz asked him, hey, Joe, what about this? How do you handle this? And Joe Espada basically said, we just ignore it. We pay it no attention. We've got a good team. We're going to win games at home, on the road. For some reason, this is happening. No one is quite sure why. But it certainly is an oddity, to say the least. Because here's a team that has gone to seven straight American League Championship Series, a team that has been really the best team in baseball over that span. But at the same time, of late, they've had a problem winning at home, and no one seems to know why. I want to thank everyone for their questions, everyone for watching, for listening. You know where to find us. YouTube, Apple, Spotify. Like us, subscribe to us. And remember, we are back Thursday, live at 1230, our second fair territory of the week. We'll have two all season long. It'll be myself and Alana Rizzo, my Thursday co-host. Join us then. The first bet $1,500 offer is on. Download the BetMGM Sportsbook app on iOS or Android or visit BetMGM.com. Sign up and deposit at least 10 bucks into your new account. Place your first wager and receive up to $1,500 back in bonus bets. If the bet loses, got to use the bonus code FOUL, F-O-U-L. And if that bet does lose, your bonus bets will be available once your initial wager is settled. Gambling problem or concern? Call 1-800-GAMBLING. Hey, everybody. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content. Fair Territory airs each week, and we'd love for you to become part of our community. Here's another video you might enjoy. See you next time.